afternoon. Hello, and welcome to the Global Launch of Development Support 2023, Migrants, Refugees, and Societies. My name is Arthur Blay. I'm the World Bank Economist and Director of Development Policy. I'll be your host over the next hour as we explore different approaches to how we can manage migration better for sustainable and inclusive development. You may share your thoughts on this topic on social media using the hashtag WDR2023. And if you're joining us online, you can head over to live.worldbank.org to watch this event in English, French, Spanish, and Arabic. It's now my great pleasure to introduce Axel van Trotzenberg, the World Bank Senior Managing Director for Development Policy, who will share with us a few opening remarks. Over to you, Axel. Well, thank you, Art, and good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. It's a great pleasure to have everybody here on, and uh, what always takes a specific uh, pleasure is that since my student days, I've followed WDRs. We are now uh, 45 years in and 45 reports down, and it is great, therefore, that we are trying with uh, the WDRs to, to push development issues to really uh, ignite debate. And, and I think this year's WDR will, I think, match that, that desire of debate and ultimately action. As this year's topic is uh, migration force displacement, it is timely and is uh, highly relevant. And I think what this report is trying to do is to take an, uh, a different look at migration and force displacement. It's not only about talking only about, unquote, the problems, but also about the opportunities that are in it. And let's keep uh, uh, in mind the dimensions. There are about 184 million migrants and refugees. This is about uh, 2% of the global populations. And most of these people originate from low and middle income countries. But uh, not all move to high income countries. This is sometimes the wrong perception that everything is ending up in the OECD countries, which is not true. And uh, we think that economic migration has been a powerful force for development, making a dramatic dent on poverty, remittances, and knowledge transfers. And we have also learned that refugee situations need to be approached through a development uh, perspective. Just before the Ukrainian crisis, the average refugee in the world had been in exile for 13 years. Clearly, uh, uh, emergency humanitarian aid will not be enough, and we have to think differently, namely through a development lens. Migration is uh, only going to increase in the coming decades, and for countries at all levels of income, especially in view of demographic shift and climate change. And high income uh, countries are aging fast. And this document also shows what that means for the Italian population. I'm so sorry for Filippo Grande <laughs> that your population is scheduled to, to almost half. I hope they will do better. But it is clearly that uh, it shows how dramatic this is. And also in middle income countries, uh, we see populations declining, uh, starting with uh, with China, but also countries like Bangladesh, India, Mexico, Thailand, Tunisia, Turkey, all have fertility rates now below, below replacement levels. So these countries were, uh, may soon end up uh, uh, need workers as well. And in low uh, income countries, populations are still booming, but many youths may not have the skills needed in the global labor market, creating huge mismatches between supply and demand. And there are some very uh, you know, dramatic statistics about certain countries in Africa where it shows what kind of uh, pressures they can expect on the uh, labor markets. And uh, what this means is this is a report to be discussed, but it's also a an, an, uh, report for action. And I would actually say we cannot do this alone. And therefore, I'm so happy that, uh, Philippe, you joined, because UNHCR has been an absolute leader in this. And we have felt uh, especially privileged that we have had a great working relationship in bringing uh, your expertise to the uh, to the front line and how we could then translate that into different operations. You have been instrumental in helping us to get in the IDA, the window for host community and refugees, and clear uh, progress. And now we have had 61 projects 
in support of this. But these are the type of things we have to think. We cannot think about World Bank in isolation. You have only to think World Bank in partnerships. And particularly, I think what I thought particularly in your work has been is, is pushing the envelope because we don't see this only in, in action as it pertains to operations, but we need to do also uh, requesting actions to our knowledge, to this type of reports, and then advocacy. And I think you have been a, a great partner, but also what we need to do more. So what we hope actually of this report is really debate, not in the, in the debate that we unfortunately see in so many countries as it degenerated in xenophobia and actually very negative attitudes towards migrants. This is far more of an inclusive approach. We show actually the possibilities if you actually take a constructive uh, view as well as that the policies are based there. And we have good examples how to do it. And I think some of the panelists will elaborate on this. So let me really also first thank also the uh, panelists, but also particularly the entire WDR team who have worked hard, uh, uh, not only within the bank, but across partners to make this report happening. And what we hope is a very strong, robust debate that hopefully will uh, touch not only policies in the countries, but actually that we improve it. So with this, let me uh, turn now to my friend, Philippe Grande, our, the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, uh, that he will also share some of his thoughts. Great that you can join. I'm also today at the UN, so I will uh, go quickly to see uh, uh, the uh, here at the General Secretariat, uh, a topic about uh, financing uh, uh, development but very grateful that you can join and thank you for all your leadership. Over to you, Philippe. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Axel. And thank you very much to the World Bank for inviting me here. Um, I think you've said a lot already, so I'll just add a few more remarks from my side. Of course, for us, for UNHCR, this initiative, a world uh, development report which is dedicated to migration, to people on the move, is quite crucial. Uh, as an organization, ours, UNHCR, dealing with one aspect, one important, but still one aspect of population movements, that of forced displacement, we realize that we can only, these days, deal with it as part of a broader discussion on human mobility, on complex human mobility, which is really the topic uh, of the report. So we we applaud this initiative. We've cooperated in, we provided inputs as much as possible, but we're very, very happy of the result and um, uh, of being associated now today with its launch. Um, I agree with you, Axel. Um, we see this report as somehow um, providing new elements, almost a new foundation, hopefully, if we, if we handle it well, a new foundation to the debate on population movements. Um, and you said it yourself, a debate that too often is polluted, I use this word consciously, by uh, politics, by uh, um, uh, um, xenophobia, uh, by manipulation, by disinformation. So um, the report provides with authority also data and uh, uh, perspectives that hopefully can help us in the constant fight that we need to lead against this disinformation, against this uh, uh, manipulation. Um, you know, there are many, many interesting part. For example, the report um, dwells quite a bit on the demographic aspect of population movements. And we believe that even from our perspective, which is a different one, those aspects are crucial if 
properly laid out, if properly utilized to improving the quality, not only of the debate, but also of the policy responses, which is really what we want to achieve. Of course, UNHCR deals with refugees. This is one aspect of human mobility. I think in the report, uh, the category is broad, is, is, is indicated as migrants. As you know, we're a little bit difficult on that for reasons that you will always understand. Refugees have a, a, a significant and important legal uh, foundation in, in their rights, and we want to preserve that. But we do understand the broader aspect of the, of the, of the report. And of course, refugees are part, move very often, increasingly, as part of broader flows of migrants, which uh, the report is um, is analyzing. And the report and will help us. The report will help us. The report will help the us, uh, UNHCR, organizations with which we work closely, for example, the IOM, the International Organization on Migration, uh, deal with the complexity of these flows and apply the two compacts which the United Nations established in 2018, the Global Compact on Refugees and the Global Compact on Migration, which aim at developing new tools at the disposal of governments to respond to this complex crisis. I think this report is one of the most important contributions to the implementations of the two compacts that we have seen in the past few years. Of course, and this is my last point, uh, we have some specific refugee challenges and you have already alluded to some of them, uh, uh, Axel. Uh, we have more than 100 million people that we would categorize as in need of protection, refugees, internally displaced people, not to mention other categories. And this figure, you know, look at what's happening in Sudan as we speak, this figure, keeps growing, unfortunately. But what is interesting besides emergency is that many of them, increasingly as well, are caught in very prolonged, protracted situation. So the World Development Report, this one, this report will also be useful in tackling uh, refugees, displaced people caught in this protracted uh, uh, situation. Because as you said, and this is for us a key element of this report, it treats refugees as well as a development challenge and not just as has been the traditional approach, a humanitarian one. As a development challenges, and may I say, as a development opportunity as well. And this has the potential through its wealth of data and information to change uh, the discourse and to uh, do what the World Bank and UNHCR, you said it, have been trying to do already for a number of years to mobilize specific investments in services, in infrastructure, in economic self-reliance, which is really the development aspect of the refugee response. And in so doing, open up the debate on these responses to different audiences, to different interlocutors that once again are not traditional interlocutors uh, as you consider the issue purely humanitarian. Finance ministries, for example, or uh, um, academics that deal with development and so forth. So all in all, a very great positive evaluation of the work that has been done. Congratulations. Thank you for continuing to be focused and looking forward to having this additional instrument to further strengthen our partnership with the World Bank and the work that we're doing in, uh, uh, in modernizing, making more sustainable our responses to refugee crisis. Thank you. Thank you very much, Axel, and thank you very much, uh, Commissioner Grandy. Beaucoup, Axel, et merci, Monsieur le Commissaire. Notre travail a été préparé par une équipe multidisciplinaire présidée par Xavier de Victor. Le rapport à cet égard 
reflète l'expertise de toutes ces personnes. Il y a eu également des consultations avec les pays concernés à travers les communautés partout par le monde et nous avons parlé du débat, l'objectif We would now like to share with you a short presentation summarizing the key findings of the report, which is narrated by Joyce Ibrahim, who has managed the report. Thank you, and let me briefly summarize the key findings of the report on behalf of the team. So this report is really about the 184 million people across the world who live in a country other than their country of nationality. The majority of them, about 80%, are economic migrants, and about one-fifth are refugees. And if you look at the pie chart, you'll see that almost half of them live in low- and middle-income countries, which raises important development issues. So this report was written against a backdrop of a world facing profound transformations. As we're seeing, there's been unprecedented demographic changes across the world, and this is sparking a global competition for workers which we saw playing out quite recently during the COVID pandemic with the medical staff. So high income countries are aging really fast. Just to give you an example, Italy is expected to see its population cut by half by the end of the century. And as another example, one out of six Koreans will be over 80 by 2050. But it's not only high income countries that are aging quite fast, middle income countries are also aging very quickly. Countries like Bangladesh, China, India, Mexico, and Turkey all have fertility rates below replacement levels. It's really only low-income countries that have booming populations. But the question is, are there young people equipped with the skills needed in the global labor market? And in addition to all this, climate change is also adding new risks, which could trigger disorderly movements. So the question then becomes not whether migration will or will not happen, but how can we manage it in a way that can make it a force for prosperity and development across the world? Traditionally, there have been two main ways to look at cross-border movements. So if you look at the left side, the first way is rooted in labor economics. Simply put, it's a cost-benefit analysis. The more the migrant skills match the needs of the destination labor market, the larger the gains for the destination country, the migrants themselves, but often also for the origin countries as well. This is what we refer to as the match of a migrant skills with the needs at the destination. But here it's important to note that the match of destination is also related to the destination country's policies. For example, if migrants are allowed to work at the level of their qualifications, their contributions to the economy will typically be much larger. Now, if we go to the right side, the other approach is about international law. This looks at people's motive. So when people move because of persecution or there's been a conflict, they're refugees and the country of destination is obligated to host them, regardless of the cost. By contrast, if they move because they seek economic opportunities, it's up to the destination country whether they want to accept them or not. So the report takes these two approaches and combines it into a single framework. And this can enable policymakers to approach migration in a more comprehensive manner. They can distinguish between the various types of movements and then identify policies that are tailored to each of these situations. And this applies for both origin and destination governments, but also for international cooperation. So now if we look at the quadrants, if we go to the upper left quadrant, this is the vast majority of economic migrants. They bring skills that are strong match for the destination economy, and they actually don't have any substantial needs for international protection. So as a result, their movements generate net gains for themselves, for the origin countries, and for the destination countries. So this is quite a safe space for countries to be in policy-wise, because here the policy goal is really to further increase the benefits and reduce the costs. Now, if we go to the upper right quadrant, the situation is quite similar. These are refugees whose skills are also in demand in the destination country. And so regardless of their status, their presence brings the same benefits as economic migrants, and the policy goal is quite similar, to maximize the gains. But because refugees flee immediate danger, most of them move without regard for labor market considerations. They typically move to the nearest safe haven. And so here, if we look at the lower right quadrant, these refugees may not bring skills that are in, that are in demand, 
and yet the destination countries are obligated to host them under international law. And this, of course, entails costs. And so the challenge here is how can we provide protection to these refugees in a manner that can be sustained over time, both financially and socially. And finally, if we come to the lower left quadrant, these are migrants that may not have the skills that are strong match for the destination economy, but they also don't qualify as refugees. Now their aggregate numbers are relatively small, but their movements are often irregular and unsafe, and in many cases can cause a tremendous amount of suffering. So over time, the objective here is how can we reduce the need for such high risk and disorderly movements and development can play quite a significant role in this regard. Now with these four types of movements in mind, the report proposes a series of policy priorities in each of these situations for origin and destination countries. So if we look at the upper quadrants, um, in the cases where migrants do bring skills that are a strong demand in the destination, the policies for origin countries are centered around remittances, knowledge transfers, skills development, and mitigating brain drain. And for countries of destination, the policies can focus on economic and social inclusion. Now for refugee hosting countries, it's really about taking a medium term perspective from the start, because as we know by now, many of these situations last for years. So these policies include things like letting refugees work, accessing services, and moving within the country. And then in the case of distressed migrants, we need to recognize and respect migrants' dignity. At the same time, we can work to strengthen resilience, develop domestic alternatives at home, and enhance these migrants' skills. In the long term, this could help reduce the need for migrants to take such big risks for their life. So to maximize the development impacts of migration, we need a number of additional elements. International cooperation, both bilateral and multilateral, financing instruments that are fit for purpose, and perhaps most importantly, we need to strengthen the voices that until now have been typically underrepresented in the debate. So let me close here and we look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, Joyce, uh, to you for this presentation and to the whole WDR team. It truly is uh, a challenge to do justice to such a rich report in such a brief space of time. Um, let me now invite Commissioner Grandy to join our other distinguished panelists who I'd like to introduce briefly. We're very honored to have joining us uh, Ms. Christiane Fox, Deputy Minister for Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship of Canada, Monsieur Thibelé Dramé, former Minister of Foreign Affairs and former Member of Parliament in Mali, and Ms. Alejandra Botero, former Director General of the National Planning Department in Colombia. Before we jump into the uh, discussion, uh, just on a technical note, I've received a message from our production team. Could I please ask the interpreters to ensure that you are toggled to the proper interpretation channel so that uh, we uh, maximize the, the reach of this rich discussion? Um, so let, let me jump straight into um, our, uh, our first question for the panel. I'd like to kick off the discussion with one of really the most challenging issues that everybody has been focusing on so far, that of refugees. Commissioner Grandi, we know that there are about 37 million, uh, 37 million refugees worldwide, and we've already heard several people emphasize the reality that many of them stay in exile for years, if not decades. The World Bank and the UNHCR have had a long partnership working together to forge a development response to these situations. What lessons should we draw from these efforts and what should we focus on going forward? Over to you, Filippo. Thank you. Thank you very much, Art. Uh, actually, I spoke a bit about that, but let me add a few elements and then it would be good to hear from the others. Um, like you said, we have I think our partnership with the bank is quite exemplary and can, in this respect, and can provide useful lessons on how to deal with the population movements from a development perspective, which is the purpose of this discussion. Uh, we, you spoke about long partnerships, indeed it is. As a matter of fact, it's only in the last five years that we have really, uh, it has really taken off 
and given very substantive results to the creation through the creation of special instruments, um, uh, a financial instrument under IDA for countries hosting large numbers of refugees, and another financial instrument, a similar one for middle-income countries, the GCFF, which we have used in the Middle East, now in Latin America for the same purpose. We have been able to mobilize billions of dollars, or the bank has mobilized billions of dollars, aimed not so much at the humanitarian support of refugees, but at, for example, their inclusion in national services, at the infrastructure that may benefit both refugees and the host communities. And in doing this, of course, uh, we have been able to reinforce good policies established by host countries. So in a way, there is a common interest. Countries hosting large numbers of refugees um, develop positive, inclusive policies and receive international assistance to strengthen their services, their infrastructure, through uh, through this uh, through these uh, financial instruments, so the the lessons learned here are essentially one that dedicated instruments are very very important. The two they need to be linked to sound inclusive policies aimed at making refugees more self reliant, but aimed also at supporting communities hosting them, and finally, of course aimed also at finding solutions eventually for these population flows. And another lesson has been that because of the bank's financial capacity and uh, its uh, authority in this field, other actors have mobilized along the same lines. There are countries in like Uganda, for example, where we have started working in this fashion already five, six, seven years ago, where a multiplicity of other actors, be they regional uh, banks or bilateral development organizations, are stepping up with the same support. And this really allows uh, for more sustainable uh, uh, responses. Oh, thank you very much, Filippo. And you said you said a lot about inclusion in your response, and that's actually a, a great note to uh, uh, on which to turn to Alejandro Botero. Um, Alejandro, uh, you know, uh, I I have to say I learned a lot um, working with the WDR team on this report. And the one example that always came up was uh, that Colombia has done this and Colombia has done that. So I wanted to turn to you to give you an opportunity to say a little bit more about the tremendous efforts that Colombia has made in hosting and integrating Venezuelans into Colombian society. Uh, what would you say are the, the key lessons that the international community should draw from this experience? And what should the international community focus on next? Thank you, Art. Thank you very much for the question. And it's a pleasure to be here with all of you. And again, congratulations to the WDR team for a fantastic report, which I agree with Filippo and I agree with Axel. This is going to really shift the debate in the future as to how we, we have to tackle migration and migration challenges. So regarding Venezuela, the Venezuelan integration, uh, the Venezuelan migration integration in Colombia, I think that one of the key issues is the fact that it was long-term, it's long-term thinking and ambitious thinking. And in that sense, the help of for example, uh, Filippo with uh, being with us and supporting us through this very long bet. You know, we are a middle income country. We are, this is a South South migration. So to issue, to convince internally and externally that it was worthwhile to issue a 10 year TPS status was I think very key because as, as we are going to see in the report, the migration costs are very high for the migrants, you know, to make that decision to actually stay, and in the case of to Colombia, to actually regulate themselves. We already had over about a little less than 2 million when the TPS was launched, of which more than half of them were irregular migrants. They were still here, and it was the country in transit to the rest of Latin America, but they were irregular. So it was a problem that's here. We need to see how we can actually incorporate it. So I think that long-term vision was key because that also helps us transition from that humanitarian perspective to a more long-term development perspective. 
The other thing which I think is key and is also highlighted in the report is the fact that we need to think of migration in a holistic manner, not just labor economics, but in terms of the, all, everything, integration in terms of identity, in terms of culture. In the case of the Venezuelan migrants, 40% of them were uh, younger than 28 years old. So these are families that are here to stay. The first reason in the first wave was coming because of job issues, but by 2020, the first reason for migration was family integration. So in that sense, we really have to think about how to incorporate the children in the education system, the health system, the financial programs, sorry, the social programs that we have. And I think that that is a very broad challenge because you really have to make the whole government force to work together to make sure that the, that the, that it's not just an identity card that you give, but that this comes with a promise that has all the rights, eh, except for the political rights, but all the other rights that all other Colombians have. Um, and I think that brings me back to the last, well, to the last issue, which is how to promote and coordinate formal instances of coordination. Now, if we had to do it very quickly, because there, has, there was a very large influx in the last three or four years, just to give you a sense, right now we have about 2.5 million Venezuelan migrants in Colombia. Colombia is a country with 50 million, a, a population of 50 million. So already 5% of the population are Venezuelan migrants. So we need to do this regular regularization very quickly. So having to work with the international community to see from how to print out, uh, you know, quickly the IDs to make sure how we coordinate with all the ministries to make sure that we have that holistic approach and to how we work with the local governments, with the mayorships, with the governors, to make sure that this is effectively implemented is key. Coordination and a momentum to effectively implement so that you can actually make do on the promise is, is very important. Oh, th thank you very much. Um, I, I was really struck by the um, long-term perspective of your response. And you know the ten-year amnesty certainly is a key feature of of the policy, right? This is an extremely, perhaps unprecedentedly um, forward-looking um, approach to dealing with uh, with the situation. And it also really resonated with me how you described how migrants are are people with families and needs and aspirations. And you know, I, I can't resist putting in a, um, a plug also for the excellent research that has been done by our World Bank colleague Sandra Rosso and many of our collaborators that has really provided concrete, measurable evidence of the benefits that these policies have brought to families to help them to meet these needs and aspirations um, as they as they adjust to new lives in in Colombia. So let me now turn to uh, to um, uh, the topic of economic mig migration and the experiences of both origin and destination countries in in in, in managing migration. So I'd like to turn now to uh, to Tibele Drame. Um, uh, Tibele, people often think of migration as a south to north phenomenon. Yet the WDR 2023 emphasizes that this is not the case, with nearly half of migrants making their lives and their ways in developing countries. Mali is an example um, as an origin country um, for many migrants. How do you see the benefits as well as the costs related to migration for Malians? And how would economic migration better contribute to poverty reduction across West Africa? Over to you, Tibede. Could I just ask you to unmute, please? I'm sorry, Tibile, you're still muted. Maybe if our tech colleagues could unmute uh, Tibile remotely. I'm sorry, Tibele, we still don't hear you. With your permission, um, perhaps we could just turn over to Christian for a moment for the perspective from uh, receiving migrant migration receiving countries, and then we'll come right back to you once uh, once the technology is sorted out at your end. My apologies, so we'll, we'll come right back to you. Um, sorry about that. Um, um, Christian, uh, Canada has been receiving economic migrants for many decades, and on a personal note, I have to mention that I was one of them emigrating to Canada from the Netherlands as a very young child with my family in the late 1960s. 
Could you tell us a little bit more about the strategies that Canada has put in place to attract and integrate migrants with skills uh, that match labor market needs? And then we'll go back um, after your response to TV today. Um, absolutely, over. absolutely. Uh, first of all, thank you so much uh, to the WDR team for this report. And thank you for having me on this panel. And I would say that the report is extremely timely for us in the context of what we're doing here in Canada, because we have been asked to take a look at our immigration system as a country and see whether or not it is uh, fit for purpose for an immigration system of the future and reflecting on kind of what is our vision and whether or not uh, our programs actually match that vision over the long term. And so reading the report and uh, the findings has been really important in our reflections on giving our government and our prime minister our best advice as to where the country uh, would like to go. And I would say on the question of economic immigration, in some of the discussions and the consultations that we've been having uh, through this review, um, we have reflected a lot. And, and in fact, it's been described to us as immigration being the biggest economic program that the country has in terms of leveraging skills and building our economy. And that very much resonated with me because we've actually talked a lot about the human capital model and what we need to do in terms of selecting skilled immigrants. And, and for us, uh, the debate and the discussion and the challenges has been around what is the right mix between low skilled and high skilled? What types of programs to attract and retain? But I think one observation that I would make for this uh, for this group and for our audience today is traditionally Canada has looked at our immigration in a very siloed approach. You are an economic migrant. You are a refugee. You are you know we we categorize people. And I think as part of this review, we need to find ways to break that up and say, you could be a refugee, yet you have skills and you have experience that can benefit this country. And so how can we ensure that we've got the right settlement supports, the right integration, the right welcoming to be able to move people in various pathways? And I think that that is definitely top of mind for us as we think about our skills strategy of the future. And 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 we've learned a lot through programs and, and uh Alejandro's comments around regularization, around uh, pathways and creating pathways, or Filippo's comments around um, looking at the refugee population, displaced populations around the world, and thinking about those pathways. And it, and and for Canada, that is a big part of our strategy, and that that thinks about temporary foreign workers, but also that global skills talent that we want to recruit. Um, I would also say that. Um, as a country, we're very much looking at changes to our, our point system for economic immigration uh, to look more at um, some of the uh, needs of the country with respect to front of Concafun immigration, with respect to specific skill sets that we require both for current needs and future needs and be able to allocate points differently in that context. We are working with businesses to see how they can be part of this with government academic institutions to see if we can do a, a whole of society lift on immigration. And I would say that um, foreign credential recognition is a challenge for our country. We need to do better. We need to recognize skills and we need to start breaking down those barriers so that people who come can, to the country can give their full uh, experiences and skill sets to the benefit uh, of, uh, of Canada. And, and as you noted, benefiting back from their um, uh, home countries as well, which we see in the report that link between um, transfers between Silicon Valley and, and India's IT uh, industry. So I think um, looking at economic immigration in less of a siloed approach and thinking about refugee labor mobility in a different way, and that's where our focus is going. So thank you so much for the opportunity to share some of that with you today. Oops. Thank you very much, Christian. Um, and, uh, you know, your remarks really resonate, I think, with some of the messages in the report, both um, emphasizing the um, uh, both emphasizing the economic opportunities that um, immigration presents for receiving countries, but also the point that you made about the difficulty of having a siloed or a purely binary categorical approach between distinguishing between refugees and economic migrants. I think one of the 
the, the messages that comes through clearly in the report is that we really need to sort of view you know that dimension in our framework as as a continuum. People vary in their in their protection needs. They vary in their um, uh, in their economic motivations for for, for migration. Um, uh, and in fact, this blends very nicely into the next um, question that I wanted to get to. But before I do so, let me go back to Tibile to see if you've um, uh, successfully unmuted. And again, we'd love to hear very much from your perspective as. Um, as a former policymaker in a important source country for migration, how do you see the benefits as well as the costs related to migration for Malians? And how do you think that migration could better contribute to poverty reduction in West Africa? Over to you, Tibile. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, congratulations to the World Bank for this excellent report, which is going to shed a new, new light on a um, top international issue, the cross-borders movement, migrants, refugees, and IDPs, and internal displaced persons. I have had the opportunity to congratulate the World Bank for his clear and firm stand when Tunisia launched a campaign against Sub-Saharan Africans. Once again, great. Thank you for that. Um, which will, that position will give to the World Bank and to this new report uh, a particular uh, position in the international debate. But this report should not serve only for the debate. It should serve also for actions. For instance, um, urge the World Bank to put together countries of origin of migrants and regions of origin, because inside several countries, you have particular regions which are home for migrants. I think it's good to put them together, um, obviously cross borders. I'm thinking of, for instance, Western Mali, Northern Senegal, Southern Mauritania, the Gambia, etc as examples, but regions, actors could be together with state actors, with obviously international actors, such as the World Bank, ECOWAS, um, Maghreb Union um, uh, organizations, and the African Union, the EU all together to think concretely how concrete step could be taken for the development of the, these regions. This is the best way to serve today, uh, the development, also the best, way, the best way to serve the my, migrations. In my country, in Mali, we don't raise the question like, is migration will serve the development? Because it, it should be how best the migration could serve the development because for decades, migration served the development. Since the beginning, since when it was a survival strategy for communities, for local people, when the young, the young people were going abroad, starting by West Africa, Central Africa, and obviously Europe, and now Asia, and um, other part of the world, such as um, Middle, Middle East. So it started as a strat survival strategy, and now the migration has become a development strategy. If you visit some of the regions of the Sahel, not, not only Mali, Senegal, Mauritania, the Gambia, you will see the home of the, of the, of the migrants are some time more developed than other parts of the countries because of the involvement, the commitment of migrants. And it started by the achievement of some, let's, let's say, social infrastructure, such as um, religious infrastructures, also schools, health centers, etc., and uh, water um, infrastructure. So today, in these regions, it, including electricity in, this, in the Sahel, 
in North Senegal, South Mauritania, Western Mali, migrants have achieved a lot. The question should be today, how best the migration could serve the development? This is why I am urging the World Bank to take steps to put together these actors, the migrant associations, regional actors, the regions, local assemblies, regional assemblies, of course, government and international actors for a serious reflections how to speed up the development of these uh, poor regions. You were also the issue of war. When you talk of Sahel today, you have to mention, unfortunately, terrorist violence with its consequences. Uh, high level um, amount of refugees, of internally displaced persons. So there is here also a place for something which can be done by the World Bank using its international influence to promote peace, stability, and security in these regions. Thank, thank you very thank much. You, thank you. Uh, once again, congratulations for this excellent job you've been doing. Uh, thank you, Thibode. And, and um, let me assure you that we take your challenge to make this a report not just about debate, but about action very, very seriously. And I think already in your remarks, you've pointed to many of the channels through which the report sees ways in which there are sort of concrete steps that both host and recipient countries can take to maximize the benefits that migration can bring. I want to come back to you in just a moment, Thibele, but uh, let me first um, uh, uh, move us on to our third, um, our, our third topic of discussion, which is in some ways one of the most challenging ones in the report. This is the discussion of the, what the report refers to as the distressed movements of people across borders. This refers to situations where some migrants are so desperate to improve their lives that they take extraordinary risks to move across borders, too often with tragic consequences for their own lives. Formulating a humane response that respects both the dignity of migrants and the sovereignty of borders poses unique challenges for many, many countries. So, you know, we, we didn't promise you any easy questions to any of our panelists. So let me turn back to, to Filippo for a moment and ask uh, you for your perspectives on this issue. There have been discussions about extending international protection obligations, for example, in the context of climate change or under other circumstances that lead people to move out of desperation. What is your perspective on how we should think about this issue? I would say uh, two things. Um, of course, people move these days for a variety of reasons. And uh, actually, climate, climate change is a good example. You mentioned that. There is no doubt that climate change is a factor in pushing people away from, or forcing literally people away from their homes. But it is also a very diverse factor. You know, it, it varies from people moving because of rising sea levels, to people moving because of natural disasters, to people moving because, and these are, this is an area more germane to our work, uh, because uh, climate change deprives communities of resources and creates conflict. It's what we see a lot in the Sahel, like was mentioned, we see it in the Horn of Africa, we see it in, in other places. Now, it is clear that uh, um, people moving for these and many other reasons, also not related to climate, um, some of them will uh, have what we call in UNHCR international protection need or simply protection needs. So in other words, they are refugees or refugee-like, and they have um, a very substantive body of legislation, of international legislation, that should, this is our <laughs> advice to governments, should inform the responses. This should be taken into account. This is what, this is the bread and butter of what my organization does. Advise government on how to craft responses in these situations that you mentioned that are respectful of international law. Now, what we do in support of that, in recognition also that these movements are extremely 
complex and burdensome, especially for poor countries where the bulk of these movements is happening. These are not movements to rich countries. These are South-South movement often between one country in crisis and one country with few resources. So that's what we have been developing with the World Bank, responses that are more sustainable, that are not purely humanitarian, that look beyond the short term and take into account the possibility that these people will stay for a long time, that they will use national services, that this will have an impact on local communities and so forth. This is the beauty, if you want, of this approach, this longer term approach, which the report, which this report will no doubt uh, 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 s- s- strengthen, I think. Um, Thank you very I, much. So, I, so I, therefore, I, this is, I, you know, there's much more to say, but this is the gist of this. The report will help uh, craft the responses that are needed in this situation that is increasing that you have described of mixed flows of which a part is uh, of people in need of international protection. May I just say very quickly that for the others that are not refugees, not in need of international protection, there is a great need in the world of better migration management. Because many people, by the way, present themselves in countries where they go to as asylum seekers, because that's the only legal entry point in that particular country. So if countries develop better channels, better avenues for regular migration, the pressure on asylum will also diminish. And that better migration management can also be well supported by this report. Absolutely. I think that's a very important message that's in the report, which also points out how the problem of people going through channels that aren't designed for them is one of the things that is also undermining the consensus around migration, which in some countries is fragile at best. And so it becomes very, very counterproductive. Um, We just have a few more minutes left, and I want to make sure that we get back to our three remaining panelists. So let me turn to you, uh, uh, Thierry, briefly. Uh, You published an article a few months ago calling on African leaders to do more for their people who are putting their lives at risk as they cross the Mediterranean Sea. What do you think they could do now, and how can the international community support them? Thank you very much. This uh, article was published in in Jeune Afrique, and uh, it was aimed to sensitize Africans about their responsibilities, responsibilities in what was happening or is happening in Mediterranean Sea. The migrant crisis in Mediterranean Sea is an African crisis primarily. And I think Africa should take the lead to give the right response to that situation. When I say Africa, I'm not thinking of only governments of African Union. I'm also thinking of the civil society, academic, other actors, it should together see something to do. It should be responsive. We cannot just sit and look at inter- European public opinion, European press reacting to the death of thousands of young Africans who lie in the bottom of the Mediterranean Sea. Africa should act as it is a vital issue for Africans, for young people in Africa, for the youth of Africa, and Africans should take the lead. By publishing some time ago this paper, I wanted really to launch an appeal to all sectors of African societies, not only government, but governments, not only African Union, but African Union, civil society, academics, Sometimes and some African individuals, the famous individuals, African throughout the world, who can say something about this disaster, this devastating um, attempt to cross Mediterranean Sea with its consequences. But yeah. once again, there is room to do something because we know that since what happened recently in Tunisia, but also in Libya. Something has to do. This is why I think the Maghreb Arab Union should be involved in your next actions with ECOWAS, with African Union, with others. 
with regions, with migrant associations, all together to have a serious meeting to think about what can be done, what should be done, and what can be done in terms of development of regions that provides migrants throughout the world. Uh, th thank Once you. again, thank you. No, no, thank, <clears throat> thank you very much, Chibere. And um, I think the, um, uh, the note that you ended on about the importance of international cooperation is actually something that um, meshes nicely into the last uh, two questions that I wanted to put to uh, to Christian and to Alejandra to uh, round out our discussion. So Christian, um, I'd like to invite you to say a little bit more based on Canada's experience about how you think that countries can best work together to maximize the benefits of migration. You had mentioned, for example, in your introductory remarks, the importance of recognition of credentials, you know, which fundamentally is about an international agreement to recognize the skills of individuals uh, coming from outside uh, and uh, outside of one's borders. Um, perhaps you'd like to say a little bit about this or about other aspects of the international cooperation agenda that you think are important. And if I may ask you, if you could please keep yourself to a, a minute or two so that we have uh, a chance to give the last word to, uh, to Alejandra. Well, I think uh, I will be brief in my response. I think you're absolutely right. I don't think that we can solve these enormous challenges individually. I think that we need to work with partners. I think we need to learn from each other. I think that, um, you know, with the highest levels of global displacements on record, as was said by others on the panel, uh, we cannot respond to this challenge individually. So I would say that the partnerships uh, that we've created through, um, you know, networks have helped us enormously better prepare uh, for uh, whether it be irregular crossings or refugee resettlement efforts uh, over the last few years. One of the elements that we have to look at is how can Canada better respond to international crises and how can we be uh, a good partner on the international scene? So using um, uh, the UN Network for Migrants, working closely with UNHCR, looking at Global Forum on Migration Development. I think this report actually can really help inform the work of that, um, of that group because it kind of gives us uh, information that we can sort of collectively look at and think about if there are 3.5 billion people living in um, climates, you know, uh, crisis areas of the world, we have to prepare globally on how we respond to that. So I do think uh, the report is part of it. So I would say we need to work on pathways, we need to work on humanitarian response, and we can only do that through partnership. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Christian. Um, let me turn to Alejandra to uh, to give you the last word as we are running out of time. Uh, but uh, maybe, uh, Alejandra, if you'd like to say a little bit more about the role of regional initiatives as part of the menu of uh, possibilities for international cooperation. How has regional cooperation been important, uh, for example, in the case of Venezuelans and Colombia, and how do you think it could be strengthened further? Thank you, Art. Yes, I think um, regional cooperation, cooperation in general, but regional in the case of, for example, the Venezuelan migration is key because, as I said before in the intervention, right now, as of January 2023, there are already 7 million uh, Venezuelans who've left, of which 6 million are staying in Latin America and 2.5 million are staying in Colombia. So Colombia is sort of like where most of them are, but also is the gateway because of the large frontier that we have to the rest of the country. Only working together is how we're going to solve what the report calls the policy trilemma, is to see how we can think long term to incorporate in development and make sure that this is a win-win situation, you know, put it that way, for the migrants, for the destination countries, and also in a sense for the origin country as well, because they will be able to have eventually people who can come back and use the skills they've learned to a uh, for pues, for their origin country. So I think in that sense, regional cooperation, such as the Quito agreement, where you have where where technical groups are working on uh, uh, similar work permits, on uh, making sure that, as Cristian was saying, the the education credits, everything is 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 being able to be effectively used in each of the countries. Um, all these like um, policies that will help us as a whole, as a region, better integrate migrations. Are, it, integrate migration is key. But one other uh, key thing I think, Art, that I would say two more points. 
One is the fact that it's a technical instance is, is fundamental because governments come and go. So for example, when we started with the TPS, we didn't have any diplomatic relations with Colombia. So we were in that gray area where they're like need-based refugees in a sense or, or fleeing, but with necessity, that gray area that I think is very key to this for this report to talk about, not just have the binary issue, but now, for the Colombian government does have a diplomatic relationship with Colombia and that changed. That doesn't mean we still need to address in the long term all these uh, situations. So I think it's key that it's a technical instance and that the world oversees how these promises are actually being implemented because it's one thing, so it has to be technical, but it also has to be put forth by regional organizations such as the development banks, such as the United Nations, to see whether these regional instances are actually making these agreements and they're actually being implemented in the countries. So um, so in, in summary, I think it's key, they're very important and they have to have a long-term vision, not just a government vision, but sort of a statewide vision for each of the countries involved. Uh, thank you very much, Alejandra. That's actually such a super important point because, you know, when you put yourself in the position of a government that is trying to make commitments about what will happen to somebody's status 10 years into the future, ensuring that this is not subject to the whims of changing politics, that there's a technocratic co commitment to ensure that these the, these uh, these promises can be honored in the future is, is terribly important in terms of providing migrants with the security that they need. So on that note, let me thank um, Alejandra Tibele. Filippo and Christian uh, are distinguished panelists for a very stimulating discussion. And thank you also to our worldwide audience for, uh, for tuning into this launch of the World Development Report. You can find the full report online at worldbank.org. And we hope that this event is just the first of many opportunities that you have to engage with the messages of the World Development Report, migrants, refugees, and societies, and the insights that it brings to help policymakers navigate the policy dilemmas that we've discussed today with the goal of ensuring that migration is a force for development for all people. Thank you very much and wishing everyone a very good day.